Hello guys, Oscar Hotel 8, Sierra Tango November here from Survival Tech Nord. Today we're going to go through the questions I received the most about my Raspberry Pi in the field. Now this video isn't meant to be a tutorial, in fact, it's more of an overview of all of the modifications or additions I've made to my Raspberry Pi to make it more practical for field communications. Ultimately, I will make unique tutorial videos for the modifications to the Pi you see in this video. For now, we'll do this video and I'll leave links in the description to the information that I used to get my Raspberry Pi up and running. So, stick with me and I'll tell you all about my Raspberry Pi. You are listening to the emergency broadcast systems. This station broadcasts emergency news and official information on the air for a sign narrative. For both my Yaesu FT891 and my Yaesu FT817, I'm using the Raspberry Pi 3B Plus, and I'm very happy with it. The 3B Plus features a 1.4 gig 64-bit processor. It's got a gig of RAM, dual band 2.4 and 5 gigs wireless LAN, plus Bluetooth 4.2. By Raspberry Pi standards, it's an absolute monster. I run my Raspberry Pi headless. That basically means without a monitor, but I use an Android tablet as a wireless touchscreen to connect with and control the Pi. To connect the Raspberry Pi and Android tablet when I'm away from my home network, I set up the Raspberry Pi as an access point. You can see it there listed as Portable Ops. So I use that Portable Ops network to connect to the Raspberry Pi using the VNC Viewer client. I also set up the Raspberry Pi with the static IP address to make accessing that access point easier with the VNC client. So I go ahead and start that connection and then I'm on the Raspberry Pi desktop. Now I can start any app I want, FL Digi, FT8 Call, WSJTX, and so on. When we look at it this way, we can understand why some operators would believe I'm running these apps on an Android device, but I'm not. They're actually running on the Raspberry Pi. As a side note, I'm not limited to using the Android tablet to connect to my Raspberry Pi. That's a personal choice. Once the VNC server is running on the Raspberry Pi, I can actually connect to my Raspberry Pi and control it from any operating system. The point of doing it this way is station interoperability. I don't want to really connect to the Raspberry Pi. I want my Raspberry Pi and my radio to act as a single cohesive integrated unit. Integrating single board computers and interoperability is something new to amateur radio, but commercial and military rigs have had this capability for quite a long time already. Finally, it's pretty amazing to be completely untethered from the radio and the Raspberry Pi. I'm running three pieces of software on the Raspberry Pi. As you can see here, the first one is FT8 Call. I'm also using WSJTX for antenna testing with Whisper, and from time to time I'll also use FT8. Needless to say, I'm also running the Swiss Army Knife of Digital Modes, FL Digi. From these three, FL Digi is the only one that really can't be utilized with a touchscreen. So to be practical, it's necessary to carry a miniature keyboard and mouse if you want to utilize the capabilities of this app. Finally, even though they're not perfect running on a Raspberry Pi with a touchscreen, I'm incredibly grateful to have these apps running on a Raspberry Pi in such a portable package. Software like WSJTX and FT8 Call require a pretty accurate clock, at least within two seconds of real time. The most clever and agile amongst us will definitely be able to synchronize the clock using WWV if you can actually hear it. 
manually synchronizing with WWV is absolutely okay, but I want to reduce the tasks and reduce operator fatigue in the field. So my primary means of keeping the system clock up to date is using a GPS. I know there are those operators who will call this an additional layer of complexity and potential failure, but this is simply one of three different ways I have to keep the system clock up to date. So let's go through and take a look at them. As you can see from the list, I have five different references to keep the system clock up to date. The first is NMEA or November Mic Echo Alpha, and that's actually the NMEA sentences coming from the GPS. When I'm connected to the internet, I also have network time sources that help keep my system clock up to date. Ultimately, the GPS is the backup for the network time and vice versa, but there's also a real-time clock. So let me explain. The GPS is the primary reference for the system clock. When I'm connected to the internet, these other sources are also available as references. The GPS also keeps the real-time clock up to date. So if for some reason I lost my GPS and network time references, the real-time clock, as long as it maintains some level of voltage, would continue to keep the system time up to date. That actually leaves me with three very simple and easy to configure fail safes for synchronizing system time. If all of the references fail, we have bigger problems in the world, but if I am worried about communications, I can always synchronize with WWV. Before we close down this part of the video, the real-time clock functionality comes from the Pi Juice hat. There's other real-time clock modules for the Raspberry Pi, but I wanted to use this one because of the other functionalities and features it provides. So let's talk about external DC power for the Raspberry Pi. Now you've all seen how my Raspberry Pi is kind of funny looking. It has the Pi Juice hat sitting on top of the main board. Now there's a couple of different reasons for using the Pi Juice hat. Firstly, it's got the real-time clock we talked about in the last segment. Secondly, it has a built-in battery to power the real-time clock and the Raspberry Pi. It also has an external port so that we can power the internal battery or use an external battery to power the Raspberry Pi. It's also got built-in battery management, so you can assign different tasks to happen at a certain battery voltage. For example, shutting down or going to sleep when the battery reaches a certain level. This is an excellent way to protect our SD card from an abrupt or hard shutdown. Finally, the Pi Juice hat also has three programmable buttons on front. Users can decide what they want those actual buttons to do. I've programmed my buttons for startup, sleep, and soft shutdown. Now, regardless of all the innovations with the touchscreen, sometimes we still need to rely on a good old fashioned keyboard. Now, there was absolutely zero chance of you getting me to carry a keyboard and mouse man portable. Thankfully, I was able to find this Bluetooth keyboard with an integrated mouse and pointer arrows. It's Bluetooth and it has a built in rechargeable battery that charges over USB. It's small enough and light enough that I don't mind carrying it, but it's large enough that I can tap the keys like tapping an SMS message out without being too uncomfortable. Here you can see me typing out a short message on FT8 call, and then we'll cancel that message with the escape key just because we don't really want to send it out. Anyway, it's cheap and it works really well. So now it's time to talk about what's next or what's left to do with the Raspberry Pi. Well, actually, I think it's time to build an enclosure for the Raspberry Pi, the GPS, the audio interface, and of course the uh, Pi Juice hat. 
The actual idea is to get the Raspberry Pi, the audio interface, and all the peripherals mounted inside a 3D printed case. Then hardwire the USB connections between the GPS and the Raspberry Pi and the audio interface in the Raspberry Pi before mounting them inside an enclosure. We then 3D print that enclosure and mount it permanently on top of the Yaesu FT891. That's why everything's been left kind of sloppy. I mean, uh, you see in every video the Raspberry Pi and the audio interface sitting on top of the rig. Now, I wanted to get everything working, get everything working together, the audio interface, the Raspberry Pi, the GPS, before I figured out how to enclose them and mount them permanently to the radio. Another thing I'm looking forward to doing is dumping the USB connector to power the Raspberry Pi. One of the features of the Pi Juice hat is the built-in voltage regulator. So you can actually power it externally while still recharging the internal battery with anything between four and 10 volts. So the idea is to find myself an RF quiet voltage regulator with a wide input voltage range and an output voltage of five volts, two or three amps. Perhaps this can be one of the DIY projects on the channel, but the idea is to power the Raspberry Pi and the radio from the same DC power source. Now it's almost time to close down this video, but I want to close it down with a discussion. And I want to talk about innovation in amateur radio. Nearly everything you see on the channel is an experiment. I mean, everything is work in progress. It's all an experiment, and you guys know that. Now, operating MAM Portable with the Raspberry Pi has really started the gears turning and getting me thinking. And I've asked myself this question, why don't ham radio manufacturers integrate a single board computer into their radios? Seeing another rig from another manufacturer with PSK31 integrated into the radio is just heartbreaking to me. Because ultimately it means amateur radio manufacturers aren't paying attention to us. So let's force them to pay attention. Tell me what you think and tell me about your own projects in the comments. And that brings us to the end of the video. Look, for those of you supporting the channel in any way you can, it's very much appreciated. You guys are magnificent. For the rest of you, if you like what I'm doing, if you like the content I'm creating, please leave me a thumbs up and a comment to let me know. And if at all possible, share this video with someone or somewhere where people might enjoy it. Rock and roll, guys. Thanks for watching. Ciao.